Folks, welcome to a very special edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. And my guest today is a standout in music history. Born in Manchuria in 1929, she and her family moved to her native Japan in 1946. After taking classical training on the piano for several years, she took up jazz. And while working with her own quintet, Oscar Peterson overheard her and immediately told Norman Grant that he had to record her. She has lived several musical lifetimes, composing, playing, and educating. She has found love several times along the way and become a mother and grandmother. For the last 40 years, she has teamed up with her husband, Lou Tabakin, and produced some of the headiest big band music in modern memory, receiving a plethora of downbeat awards, and always incorporating studio stalwarts such as Gary Foster and Bobby Shue, Bruce Fowler, and the aforementioned Tabakin. Toshiko Akiyoshi, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you very much. What are your memories of Manchuria, if any, and why were your parents there? Oh, my father actually, first, originally, he, he was working for a uh, cotton uh, company here. It's a very big company called Fuji uh, Textile Company, and mm-hmm. they had a branch in Manchuria. That's how initially, actually, my father went there. Then by the time when I was uh, four or five years old, he uh, became independent. He had his own uh, business, uh, export, import, and things like that. And you guys, but you were Japanese, I mean, you guys were Japanese descent and living in Manchuria. And yes. What was that? Did you? Did you? What was the diet? The, were you learning Chinese at that time as well? The language or no? No. It, well, I was about. Uh, well, this maybe it's maybe almost um, twenty years ago. Or so I visited China today, Manchuria. Today mm-hmm. is China. Uh, doing some television. Uh, program and then that time I realized about the, the all the Japanese uh, people that the another the community what the position they were at that time when I was there I didn't even think about it but w- Japanese uh, had a, their community and uh, <coughs> school naturally and I can't remember even one Chinese student was in a school, I think, because I think, it, first of all, you have to speak Japanese <laughs> mm-hmm. to be in a Japanese school. Sure. Maybe that's part of it, probably. But there was obviously, there was a separation between Japanese uh, community and, and the Chinese West of which is, they are the one, uh, it's, it's, it's their country. And uh, it's, uh, the, as I said, I never even thought about when I was there, when I was uh, too young to think about things like that. But I think Chinese people, with the Manchurian people, prob- they're probably looking at us in um, some degree of um, uh, um, invader is, is a probably very strong word, but still um, it's almost like being, uh, like, it could be, you know, like, it was a Shanghai, it was a part of, uh, 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 British. Sure, like, uh, an, almost like, like uh, like almost like an occupier. Almost like that, I guess. The only things I think about, it is, there was a railroad in Manchuria, it was a, was a, uh, built by Japanese railroad railroad company, and this railroad was much more modern than that time uh, existed in Japan. And it was another you know, was a, a wider uh, rail, well, and there was no separation like uh, here existed for a long time in America. The black people cannot 
uh, go to this place and that place, that kind of thing. And then it wasn't, there is no separation. If you have the money, you will sit in a uh, better class uh, uh, seat. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, you sit in economy class. So there wasn't any sort of, that kind of a separation wasn't, it didn't exist. You, you, uh, your family uh, moved to Japan, uh, and I, I just, you know, I, I have many uh, Japanese friends here in Tucson, and, uh, you know, I, could you talk a little bit about um, the honor and the respect that it needs to be shown to the adult, and how... You inco- how how your parents received, or if they knew that you had musical gift, and if they embraced that. Well, I don't know. I mean, I I started to play piano when I was uh, seven years old in Manchuria, and after the World War Two, came back to uh, Japan, and my parents uh, lost all asset. Um, I uh, I just I happened to love to play piano, and there was a, a dance hall in Beppo City, Kyushu Island, that's where, that's where uh, we uh, came back, that's where my parents came from. Um, those days, it's just a Japanese uh, dance hall, an American, uh, I guess, occupied Pay some time. Mm-hmm. The American people, the uh, soldiers, I guess, the dance hall was separated. And there was a lot of dance hall, there was not enough musician. So I was hired immediately. That's how I got into quote unquote business. And I didn't know anything about the jazz. Unfortunately, in a sense, uh, I think it's fortunate that I was hired for Japanese dance hall. And uh, there was uh, a Japanese man who is a collector, jazz record collector. And um, he spotted me, uh, and he invited me over to his home to let to play Teddy Wilson's Sweet Lorraine. That that was actually this became almost a famous story, but that's when. It, I thought, right, I like to play just like that. <laughs> That's my first, yeah. first entry to jazz. And after that, you know, those days, for for long time in Japan, as a matter of fact, till, uh, for many, many years, but those days, there was no uh, recorders available. There was, of course, no uh, book. I guess today, so just about everything is available to uh, everyone. But... There was nothing like that, so those records that he had uh, was listening and copying the music and get used to uh, jazz language, which is very different from uh, classical language, which I was uh, brought up on. And uh, that was my everyday uh, sort of my everyday's work. And he had, oh, I think about this, I didn't think about this for a long time, but he had things called uh, How to Play Jazz Piano. So written by Vincent, Vincent Lopez. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I came to this country, I asked, including Lou, I asked uh, everyone, I said, do you know me, Lopez? And uh, no one knew. And it's, this man was a, a, apparently probably was a studio musician because four or five years ago, I was in Japan after the concert. Uh, the, the One of the sponsors of that concert invited us to uh, his home. And he said, I want to you to listen to a very rare record. It was a Yoshie Fujiwara, which was the first, uh, I would say one of the first Japanese opera singer. 
who uh, formed his own opera company. And uh, he's, he's singing a Japanese song with he hired jazz musician in America and recorded. And it's, of course, it's a 78, uh, you know, it's one of those uh, acetate, the old one. Right. And, and it was, a, it's a very funny, the point was this particular, they said, I wanted to know who was the musician they were. I was, there was a no-name individual musician, but it said Vincent Lopez. Orchestra. <laughs> so, so I said, oh, here it is. You so finally I, found it. Well, he, yes, yeah, so I found it. He must be, was a, maybe it was a, you know, studio musician who was a working studio. But anyway, so he, he has written a book called How to Play Jazz Piano. It's mainly that is about, that is like a stride, uh, uh, rag time piano. Sure, sure. Like, like but, yeah. Yes. Like Willie, but, like, uh, yeah. Yes, but that that was like a new thing for me. So I had a great time trying to uh, learn that. Just, uh, Toshiko, Toshiko, everything it was like it was like a trial and error, so to speak. I want you to uh, talk about you. You brought up something earlier. How like everything today is accessible. You can find almost anything now but before no books no accessibility no venues no record players no records you had to seek it out and you actually had to be a detective and i wonder a young toshiko akiyoshi you know were there ra like when the americans were in japan trying to uh, rebuild the country so it would not become a rogue state was that did, was that when you first heard big band jazz? Were you listening to radios? How did you seek out the music? Well, first of all, I, when I wasn't interested in big band, you know, for many, many, many years. I still not. I'm not. A, I still <laughs> not a big band lover. Really? I mean, people. Yes, people were surprised, but it's a, that's the truth. Anyway, um, those. Uh, I, I think I mentioned before that there was a difference between jazz language and then classical language. The, the, that, the one that I was very uh, trying to get familiar with jazz language it was, uh, and of course trying to learn tunes by copying a record, that's how you uh, uh, I get my accumulate my uh, repertoire, but jazz language. Get used to jazz language. Now, talking about today, if anything goes, so you write about Simon. I feel I am a I'm a probably last of uh, uh, diehard jazz musician in the sense of fact that I strongly believe that of the, what the difference between jazz and classic is the, one of the difference, of course, to the one is a language, another one is a, of course, sense of reason, but what's called, people call swing. But mm. Mm. Uh, today's music, it is, neither of them uh, rarely exist. It's uh, very much like a European music. Uh, technique is up and so on, but it's really you hear real jazz language. I mean, uh, uh, you know, jazz is a organic music, so it goes someplace and then that's where it goes, that's where it goes. But I am um, last to hold, as I say, protected. I cherish the difference of the language. It's a different history, different that's that's why I um, that's why I stay. So anyway, back to what at the very beginning, it is just my every day was trying to get used to and it tried to be natural with me about the jazz language. It's a part of my uh, musical language and also to trying to. Uh, accumulate more uh, 
uh, repertoire. So one of the things about the occupying time, there's a musician was uh, uh, drafted, and they were stationed in Japan. The few of them, uh, kind of most well-known musician was the Hampton Horse, who was stationed in Yokohama. I didn't but, know that. Uh, wow. Yes. Wow. Um, uh, this is, by the way, this coming uh, 20th of this month, so there's a memorial for bass player, player called Nabil Tota, who also was in Japan that time. So some uh, some musician was known, uh, Dick Nash, who is a Ted Nash, with a, uh, uh, the father of Ted Nash, it was a Winton's band. Of course. Um, I have you know, people like... Yes, people, Dick Nash, he was a trombone player. But anyway, all this was play, and also the one who may not have a name uh, and speak, but it plays very well. Those are the musicians uh, I learned from them because I had a small group and they would come sitting in and I would learn uh by playing together, because as you know, jazz is uh, more like a uh, social art. If you play with a better player, you get better. And um, basically, that was, I was just the beginning, and it was everything was the beginning. And so that's how I learned about everything. I Every, every day was, a, it's a kind of learning process in a speak. I was, I was in Beppu, and then I, Moved to Tokyo in 1949, I believe. But anyway, uh, the one by the time I won Oscar Peterson, uh, the other harmonic came to uh, Tokyo. Uh, that was I uh, 52, I believe. It was. Uh, by that time, I was uh, I hate to say, but I was more like uh, top of the little mountain, or you could say. Biggest frog in a little pond. <laughs> <in the pond. laughs> yeah, I know, I know. So, so uh, that's I was very lucky that uh, Oscar actually came to listen. Somebody brought to me. I was playing afternoon and the night, and uh, he came to listen to me. Somebody brought him over, and with his recommendation, I was able to uh, record. For Norman Grant, and Norman Grant recorded me, and because of that recording, uh, I was able to come to uh, United States and Boston. So, you know. No, it, I, 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 I before we before we we, we jump ahead, did uh, I was hoping? You know, it's so funny, Toshiko. I I I, uh, I collect a lot of vinyl. You know, I still play vinyl, and mm. uh, I find this record in Phoenix for two dollars. Uh, maybe a month ago on VJ, and uh -huh. it has two guys. I I would like you to to talk about. It's it's Toshiko Mariano, her big band, Jazz in Japan, and it, I know the one. And 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 there's two guys. So you had a Western African rhythm section with Paul Chambers and Jimmy Cobb, but the two guys I was right. hoping you could talk about. I'm thinking they might have been in your original quintet or your original groups with Sleepy. Matsumoto and Shigio Suzuki. Uh, the uh, Sleepy Matsumoto. It, 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 that was came out. Uh, there was a, that particular time. There was a big jazz festival. Big jazz festival uh, by some Japanese uh, promoter and the tons of. Uh, musicians, sort of like a, a few uh, groups uh, came to Japan, and Miles' group was there, was the, and, and, and uh, uh, the Kame Makwe, and uh, um, the Jimmy Cobb, and uh, uh, yeah, somewhere else, but the, the Paul Chambers uh, was playing with Miles at that time. Mm -hmm. and, um, things like that, and also they, the promoter invited uh, Leonard Feather to give a, one sort of like a jazz uh, seminar, 
sort of thick with a Japanese uh, jazz critic and a historian together. So Leonard was, a, and it was that was Leonard's idea. He's the one came up with this idea. So if you remember, I, I believe that was a one, one two could be his tune. I, I, you know, it's such a long time ago, I can't remember 100%, but that's the, the came out. So the name, uh, maybe. Kizu, but, uh, Kizu, uh, Kizurazu Jink. Huh? Kizarazu Jink. Kizarazu Jink. That's, yes. yes. That's, that's, uh, then later I changed to the village because of the, uh, as you know, uh, uh, copyright situation. Because there's uh, no original melodies there. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, uh, that, that was written that particular time. Yes. You, you, uh, you came, so so Grands recorded you, and then you had an opportunity to come to Berkeley. And at that time, uh, who who were some of the uh, who were some of the people there, uh, your peers and your uh, professors that helped you um, with your composing, your composition of of of, of material. Um. It's kind of hard because I used to I used to write before I went to you know before I came to this country I had a uh, Nanette uh, the NHK uh, the radio and uh, weekly uh, program and uh, it was so I was writing before I came to this country so this basically I. I had a, I think it was a big fan of writing was a something, her Pamela was there, and he helped me to organize how, systemize, put it that way. Um, I never systemize, I still don't actually, uh, but I never systemize everything when I write. So um, that's something, but uh, I learned more than anything by playing with the oldest great player cut he used to come to Storyville and then would well, let me sitting in and in those days it's not like a today. I came here in very, very good time and much more open, uh, people much more relaxed about everything and Max is a group, you know, great uh uh crew photo was there and so on and uh Miles had a classic quintet and even a big fan, even a, even a uh, duke. Uh, so I used to sing in just about every group come uh, came uh, through uh, Storyville, and that's that was my greatest uh, probably school of all. And my asset is a, it is that because my writing is everything come from my experience as a player. Um, so if, if I didn't have that uh, experience playing with a lot of uh, great players, probably uh, I may not have uh, the kind of uh, uh, music that I, uh, I may not came up with the music that I have been written, you know, for the past few years. And then it's Oscar Pitterford, for example, like, he used to come when I was playing at the Hickory House. He used to come almost every night and sitting in. And that was fantastic. But when you're looking at that from the other side, what that means, it means Oscar didn't have the job. That's what it is. So it's not, you can't think about that today. I mean, Oscar, if the Oscar was alive today, and then the people probably lined up and uh, to listen to him. So the jazz scene was quite, quite different when I came to this country. All jazz clubs never fill. Uh, who was a listener, the most of the time, it's not that many people. Uh, but the club was owner wasn't uptight about anything, and a more club was in all over the United States, and you do make a like a, you make a round, and uh, so it's it, it's very different than today, and working hours are much longer, 
It was the New York was at 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the morning. The Boston was at 9 to 1. It was a matinee. So it's in everything different. And I feel that I was very lucky to come in this country at the time when I came. Don't you think that uh, you mentioned Max Roach, Clifford Brown, Duke Ellington, and you said it was a very open time. And don't you believe that it was open because of their their fearlessness and their leadership? And there is none of that today. Or if there was people like Max Roach or, or Duke Ellington around today, uh, the media might go out of their way to try to vilify them, to tear them down. It seems to I'm me... I'm not quite sure. I think there's a whole dynamics of the jazz business mm. has changed, mm -hmm. as I said before. For example, Miles Group, classic quintet, played at the Storyville. No one comes. They play from Monday to Sunday. <laughs> right, right. Boston is a seven night town plus matinee. No one comes to weekend. And we can, not even full, but, you know, it's enough people. But that was a normal thing. And Duke's band or Bass's band is playing a story with the club for two weeks. Like I was in uh, New York's original Birdland. With, I was hired, uh, I had a trio hired by Oscar Goodstein, who was the manager. And opposite of uh, Beishi, uh the band, or another band, like a Miles band too, but she's a group one, and uh, uh, they used to have a two group. If not, if it wasn't, if it was a one single group, I have no, you know, I I have no hope. <laughs> I have no prayer. <laughs> right, right, right. Hired, right, hired by, you know, who, mm -hmm. who am I? Right. So, I came in very, very good time, as I said before, and it was a whole, the, uh, the whole thing is, is, I guess you can talk about this all night long, why and so on, but the dynamic has changed, and now the jazz group is pretty much like a productionized. Right. And it's more, more exhibition, more, it's a, in that way, it become, uh, a little bit more close to classical music or the uh, presentation. This is what we do. And uh, that group has their own, this, and then there's a very few group uh, let somebody sitting in, which is, I have seen uh, the new Birdland here. Uh, it's a group, um, Someone came and said, I, I just couldn't think of right particular, but that's like uh, really, really uh, rare. I mean, it's the most group of, that's what we do, and that's it. So it's, it is, the whole thing is different, and it's, the, the musicians' wages are much higher than it used to be, but at the same time, the listeners have to pay more money, and when I came here, when I will play in a place like a Smalls and a Harlem place like that, you see the same listener maybe three times a week, and you see, oh, he just came again. <laughs> and uh, you can't do that today. You go into jazz club, it's 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 one 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 time you just go to hear some group. Most of the time, you see some group. <laughs> That's right. You know, and there was, so think the, the whole thing has changed. So. I must say, again, I came in a very good time. Uh, I feel very uh, sorry for the young musician today because there's no uh, place that they can watch it, you know, to play. Some few places in New York that you can, there's all night low jam session place, but other than that... Yeah, I, I look at, I, listen, I was born in 1978. I look at this, if I was going to see Lou Tabak and if, you're, if I was going to see your big band at, at, at the Village Vanguard, I'd want to walk out of there dripping with sweat. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, just, like <laughs> yeah. just you know, I mean, it, it's a visceral, emotional 
that's music, okay? But yeah. now it has become whether it's you know, like you said, people pay more money. The venues have to be nicer. You have to have a certain kind of wine and cheese. It's become very upscale. <laughs> And to me, that's really just pathetic because, and the other thing is that you talk about this idea of being open when you came here, and now this idea of being very territorial. It's unheard of to have people sit in, whereas before, it was commonplace. I look at it, you know, we need to get a little bit back to the to the grit, the grits and gravy, the, the and I don't know if it'll ever happen. <laughs> But a little bit, a little bit, gr a little bit grittier, and a little less pristine. Like, because you made a very good point. It jazz is whether people are aware of it or not. It's becoming more classically formatted now. Yeah. I, well, I, I yeah. think that that's the way it is. That's the way it is. <laughs> I want to ask think you. you can do about it. I, 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 I want to. I, I have to ask you. I, I, I need to know about this, this, this quartet that you played in. Uh, in uh, up and down the uh, the New England, New York, uh, it was yourself at the time, your husband Charlie Mariano, uh, and I believe a bass player was Ron McClure, and the drummer was Eddie Marshall. Oh, Eddie was my, you know, to me, Eddie Marshall was a, a to me is my drummer, so to speak. I think when you were young and play with someone that is, you stick with you all the time. So Eddie, I'm so sorry. I was so surprised. It was a couple of years ago. He died. Mm. He died suddenly. Actually, he was going. He was supposed to go to Japan and Blue Note with us. And day before, he just suddenly he died. But anyway, yes, Ronnie McClure. Uh, it's probably it is short time. Yes, he was he was a playing, but uh, it wasn't a regular in a sense. I I'm not quite sure that particular time. He had a regular bass player. Before that, it was a Gene Chirico and a Eddie Marshall. That's was right. A regular That's right. Section. But uh, can you talk? A, you that, know, I I I on this journey, I feel Eddie Eddie's spirit inside of me for so much of the stuff that he did in the Bay Area. I mean, I never knew him personally, but I've interviewed so many guys that knew him and loved him. And 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 for you to say that he was your drummer, I just was hoping you could spend a little bit of time talking about what made him such a good musician. I think it's a special good music, especially. It's I think it depends on what you play. To me, play the drama. For me, for my, you know, it doesn't have to be for everyone. The one who has a good symbol beat, that to me is very important. So Eddie was, you know, when the first time we played together, I think he was about 20, <laughs> God, maybe he was 22. Mm -hmm. and it, was, it was very young. And he, 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 he always had a how to play symbol beat soft with a stick. He always had that, and usually it's a normal situation when you play with a stick as a loud. If you want to, you want the drummer to play, they they play soft with a with a brushes. But he had a beautiful sound, a soft. He can play soft with a stick. Or really was, but also he was very open. In other words, some this is to me is the rhythm section is to me is important things that it is the most important. It is the rhythm. The bass player to to be able to play walk well. The, this is most important, you know. Never mind about the solo. If they play so better, it's a, it's a, it's a better, it's a good. Right. But the most important thing is it is the walk good. If you have a steady walk, uh, that's enough for me. And uh, so there are differences between. Uh, what you play de depends on the instrument. I think was uh, I try not to back up too much for the piano as a piano player. I try not to play. Also, has to know the the home player. Some home player like to hear a lot. Some home player doesn't want to hear at all or just a little bit, so on. And so you have to know the players. The, so you, you don't overfeed or underfeed, whatever it is. But for me, because I've 
I always, most of the time I was with a trio, but it's sometimes with a quartet, but I was always the most important to me was the drama to have a great symbol be that was, but also I, I, you know, I, I, I have some arrangement or I write some music has a little bit maybe out of ordinary. And Eddie was one of the very few drama who opened for that. And if he was trying to figure out how he would like to play that, maybe odd reason could be or those uh, things like that. And he would always had a certain, uh, openness, and then uh, I knew the drama when I was in school, uh, I was going somewhere, a uh, school uh, book, uh, and then I didn't, of course, I didn't have a uh, radio uh, rhythm section, and saying, somebody told me, talk of the, the, someone told me, so I had uh, this drama from uh, New York, and I had a 5 four, uh kind of music, and then he kind of, he said, he was going to put me down, I said, oh, you know, they don't play five. I said, well, <laughs> play first, then put me down. Yeah, right, right, so, right, so, right, right, and right. Uh, the funny thing about it is that later on, that became one of his favorite things to do. He said, are you going to play that tonight? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so things like that, it happens, but I think it's important to have the uh, have an open mind, uh, people who has an open mind without uh, not losing, uh, you know, if you are talking about uh, building or something, a uh, foundation, that's it. The most important thing is the foundation to me. And then uh, I would really like to have something on the top. You can build something. If you are open-minded, you can build something. So... Not the other way around. Some people can do a lot of things, but the, the, where's where's the swing or what? You know, I be, I sit in a place where the Duke said it and got that. You know, told me the things and got that swing. That's where I am. So I'm basically I'm a kind of bebop traditionalist. <laughs> so so uh, it's it's a, it's a very uh, and I said, now there's uh, hard to find uh, because the music has uh, changed somewhere. The uh, mainstream of the music is uh, it's not that something else. So it's uh, very difficult to uh, find the uh, drama and the bass player who can actually do that. You know. Because the people who were able to do it, they became old, and some of them no longer with us, things like that. <laughs> who were your, uh, you know, who were some of your, uh, you know, people talk about, you know, like, you know, gender, uh, being, a, being a woman in a, in a male-dominated uh, musical field. I just was curious uh, as to some of your peers, uh, peop uh, women that you uh, colla either collaborated with or would, would bump into on the road uh, when you were traveling with your groups. Uh, I assume Marianne McPartland was there. She's been very, she's, you know, but who, who were some of the other uh, gifted women that were, uh, that you used to cross paths with when you first came to the States? I, you know, tell the truth, I don't know, uh, Two minutes. But lately, I was asked to uh, listen to and give some advice at the Kennedy Center for young pianists. Uh, number of pianists that they have the same yearly things, and uh, so something like that. But if you're a pianist, you don't use it. You seldom have a duet concert, so <laughs> you don't. And it's, it's uh, my generation. You don't. Read, I don't know any home player. So uh, I, I have no, uh, God, I have no uh, uh, experience with it. Well, I heard a long, long time ago, Mary Lou said something like, he feel, she feel comfortable talking to men than a woman. Yeah, yeah. That's what she, she, that's what she said. That that's what I was told. But I don't really think about much uh, what, 
when I came to this country, then you know, the little people start talking about me. Uh, uh, then, then I get certain uh, resentment from uh, you know. I, the, the, uh, it, one time was a some uh, writer in California wrote say I question how authentic city things like that. Uh, Lou always say I'm a demographically challenged, and uh, so. <laughs> that, no, that, I know I know what he's yeah, saying. I mean, I know what he's saying. That that's that's uh, that part is it's it's exist. I think uh, exist, and if I don't. I think uh, I, it doesn't exist. I'd be stupid, but so, but it's something that you can't change it. If you can't change it, you, I, I always, I a long time ago when I, you know, you've been in this country in New York and there's jazz player, which is like a million players is here and so on. Uh, I developed the one simple philosophy that it was something I can't change. I'm not going to worry about something I can change. I will change it for so that I I don't have to worry about. So something like that is I can't change it. So nothing I can do. I acknowledge that sometimes I, uh, you know, sometimes I feel well, but 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 uh, that's how it is. I've been playing. Uh, over 60 years, wow. Um, it's and, uh, un- you know, it's... It, it's, it's <laughs> I'm still trying to, trying to play right. So, right. It, that's all I can do. And I can't worry about the, what the people think, and if it is, uh, I know in my cases, I have a lot, but I, I just can't worry about that. So, it's, it's, I have to worry a lot about the, my, my uh, self of trying to perfect my... On my play, which is not easy. <laughs> Toast Toshiko, well, when you, you know, when I, I picked up this album, uh, this Jazz in Japan album, and it talks about uh, Charlie uh, going to Japan and falling in love with the culture. And in fact, at that time, reading Leonard Feather's notes, you guys actually made that um, your home. What was it about the Japanese culture that so, um, so attracted uh, Charlie to it? I'm not quite sure. We never talk about that. So, but I think, as generally speaking, uh, he's. I think it's no exception to. I think it's a, one thing is that a people are uh, gentle. They are much more courteous than uh, here, um, especially when it's in New York. You know, it's a sort of like. It's not like when we go to Lou and I was at the Seattle not too long ago, and it's the people there are very courteous, very gentle, and we we see the difference. We feel the difference, and it was a kind of kind of like that. Is in Japan, there's the people are very courteous and they're gentle, and the whole country was full of those people. The air is a different. Mm-hmm. That's I think, and if you are into Japanese culture, naturally, you know, uh, we have a, a little over a thousand or nine hundred, what is it, if you go to Kyoto, or the seven hundred years old temple, things like that. So I think that's something, but it's, it's, it's uh, I think it's my wanted to stay in Japan, but jazz was, he couldn't make a living there, so I had to come back to the uh, States. But as far as uh, the culture is concerned, I, I think I think she's not the only one that, as a lot of people find uh, soothing, probably, go to Japan and sometimes the people feel, I can breathe easy. Something like that. Well, I mean, even so, I, I talked to, uh, I've done over 160 interviews, and a lot yeah. of the guys on the West Coast, you know, they talk about, you know, this musical art form that was created, you know, here is 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 more well-received over there than it is here today. <laughs> and, yeah, and, I think that, that, that's, keep, I think that that's a kind of overstatement. Mm-hmm. I think that's... I think that's not quite true. They, uh, 
misleading because the people from here, they go mainly to play, and then the people come there, and they, it's true, they will come and they appreciate, it, but it's the, the listener, uh, the jazz listener, into their life, living uh, their life, it is America. It's, uh, Japan has always been more like a, uh, they appreciate, but at the same time, that is uh, other countries' uh, culture, and we appreciate to listen to. The thing is about the jazz is when they were exported to Europe and as well Japan, I guess, they were all, the country received as an art form. Why America was a those days, I still remember all that came out from uh, uh, black people, the society, and blah, blah, blah. The jazz was a put it into different uh, level uh, uh, to tie it with the society as a different level than the classical music, which is today, it is quite different. Today, I think of, uh, happy to say, it is different, but, you know, the, the history, the old days. So that has uh, something to do with also the one who goes there, just they play concert and they come back. And they will be well received. Um, but here, people come to listen to jazz. It's a, they're part of their life. So to speak. It's in their life. And uh, I don't know, I'm expressing uh, well or not, but it's still America, it is more in a route for the listener. That's right, no, I, I mean, I that's, think that. That's what I think. No, I, I, I know what you're saying, but. Um... Like you guys go to Seattle. I mean, there are certain places in the in the in the uh, United States that are more receptive to to art and uh, and where there are still. I, I look at the I look at the accessibility and the venues here that have shrunk for the ability. Like you said, you you feel. I mean, it's really not. You're you're not the first one to say I feel bad for anyone who's a young musician now. Because it's just, you know, to me, and I'm not saying it would be any different in Japan, but, you know, I, I know for a fact that many of the African-American musicians that I interview, a lot of them moved to Europe because they did not like the way they were treated here. Yes, yes. But, uh, I, uh, you already, listen, you, 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 you made Japan your, no, you've made your, Japan. yeah. Go ahead. No, you, you've made your point, and, 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 and actually, I, 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 I understand what you're saying. I want to just move on a little bit and talk about um, there. There were a couple of guys on the West Coast uh, that I wasn't sure if you ever had a chance to collaborate with. They were uh, they were uh, eight, they were Filipino. One was George Murabus and one was Flip Nunez. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if, if you knew if you ever had a chance to, to interact with either of those individuals. No. I'm afraid not. <laughs> okay, so then talk about. I don't, I don't even know them. I, the, I, I don't even know them. Are okay. they uh, Filipino American or Filipino Filipino? Um, I believe Filipino Filipino, and they they they, they, ah. they were based mainly in the Bay Area. Uh, so it, it was. Ah, she. You know. I, I'm I'm afraid not. I don't. No, that's good. It's, it, it's it's fine. Yeah. I when you when you. Uh, you know, I, I interviewed Gabe Baltazar uh, maybe mm -hmm. two months ago, and he spoke about um, playing with you. And you said a few months ago. Yes. Oh wow! Is he is he well? He's doing great. He's in Hawaii. You know, and, and I know that. Yeah. I know that that he's from Hawaii. Well, there was a Kentos band, but he he's been in Hawaii all his life and so on. I was just uh, wondering. You just mentioned the name that I haven't heard in many, many, many years. So I was surprised. Yeah, he, That's great. He told me he, to, he he first of all he's doing very well, and and if you if you want his phone number, I will be glad to give it to you if you want to say hi. No, I think I think we'll probably have it. If he's the same place, anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so um, he talks about um, your. Uh, he uh, he was he he played with you uh, in the in in the West Coast uh, when your daughter Monday was like sixteen years old, and I just wonder, you know, how it was that you know you balanced uh, motherhood 
with your playing career? Um, I don't know. I don't. Um, God, I. You know, my daughter went to. Uh, she went to uh, Interlaken High School. So it may be great what talking about after she come back. But after she come back, my daughter come back from uh, Interlaken. I thought the game was already. I think. Uh, I think he was already moved to uh, Hawaii. Uh, I don't. Um, I don't remember having my daughter and Gabe together. Right. Well, just to, uh, you know, for, take Gabe out of the equation. I mean, you were a flourishing musician. You were you were playing, but yet at the same time, you had your obligations as a mother. I just wonder how you you balance that. Yeah, it's, it, it was. A, I I think I was as a before she was born, and I was a, as a. As a mother, I think I'm a failure. I didn't really, I, I was, because uh, when, I, when my daughter was three and a half years old, uh, I was separate from my, uh, then was a single mother. And, you know, as a jazz musician, if you're a jazz musician, you have to travel. Otherwise, they can't make a living. And then I couldn't travel because uh, I have a daughter. Mm -hmm. So I was a, in a way, I probably I was lucky. I got a job in uh, jazz galleries. Just uh, before that, it was a five for the same owner, Zig and uh, B and uh, Joe Termini. And uh, I can, but when I go to work, she had she had to be alone because our job is you can't hire babysitter. You have to have a uh, living in uh, babysit, sort of baby uh, take care, nanny. You have to have a living in because your job is from like a 9 to 3, 30, 10 to 4, things like that. So, and I didn't have the money. It's it, those days, I just didn't have, I was just barely paying the rent. So, uh, I know my, my daughter will remember that. Uh, very uh, now that she had uh, a boy when she had a baby boy, boy was born she would take it, every place where she goes she would take it now that now that uh, he's a uh, 11 and a half years old you know out of school and so on but so, but before starting a school, she would take every place wherever she was, because uh, my daughter is also uh, like music, and she, she sings and plays the food. She has her own uh, group, and she she does, uh, she travels sometimes, and so on. So, uh, because she didn't want it to, I'm sure she, did, she, did, she doesn't want to, her son to feel the way she felt when she was very little, but I have—I really didn't have choice. I think that's what I call 22. I get catch 22. I think that's what, that's what I call, I, I think. I right. just didn't have the money to have a uh, nanny living in nanny. I just, I just was so, at one point I thought it was I will change to my day job because, uh, but uh, I could not get a job because I can't do anything. I can't, you know, type, I can't uh, type, or I can't, things like that I was supposed to be able to do. So uh, I found out myself I'm useless human being. So it was a very difficult uh, time for myself and more for my daughter, I know. So I basically, I have, uh, I, this is something I regret, but there's nothing I can do because it's gone. Uh, Toshiko, I Toshiko, I, 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 yes. must, I must tell you, last summer I got to see your daughter and your, your grandson perform at Gil Goldstein's oh. uh, 4th of July concert. And oh, my, my son does not perform. Your grandson? 
Yeah, my grandson does not perform. He was playing an instrument. He was he was he, he was he was playing. No, he doesn't. He he's a, he's about he, he's he's only ten years old. He can possibly play trumpet. Well, I I saw with my own eyes. But the thing is, what what wow. I want to I have to tell her. What I, what okay, I want to say ahead. what I want to say is that Monday performed, and they sang they sang a, a version of Paul Simon's America. And she is uh-huh. very talented, and I, I yeah. think you, you know, regardless. I mean, listen, I'm a parent too, you know, two daughters, and I, no one is no, no one is perfect. So the idea of saying it is in the past, it's not something I necessarily look back on with with great pride. But you must know that you know you created a very strong, strong daughter, and 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 the genes and the tradition live on amongst your among your your grandkids. She's very talented. Also, she has a very good ear. Yeah. Something she probably got it from a father because I don't really have a good. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one. Yeah. I wanna. I wanna. I wanna end uh, this. I have a couple. Couple questions here. Uh, yes. This. Uh, you know, how did you originally meet Lou? And and. Oh, the first I met. Uh, I make it very short. There was a 1967. I. From the call, I said I, I I will have I had my own self uh, uh, presenting concert at the town hall in New York, and I hired him as a tenor saxophone player. And but before that, I met him. He was playing with a Clark Gates band. That's the first time I heard him play. And then I thought, wow, you know, it's, it's very strange. That like it sounds like a Rocky Thompson. Uh, that, <laughs> but there's a play at that particular time. She played between Rowan and uh, uh, Coltre. So I, I, I asked him to do this, and uh, he said yes, and then he went to someplace else. That's how I met. <laughs> and then, and then uh, as your relationship grew, um, when did it... Uh, we married in 69. And you, and you guys... You guys became a really prolific team in, in this uh, in in putting together these these albums with these big bands. Talk about working as a team, the strengths that you brought to it. Uh, and yeah, I I think it was a, when I was having a band. It was a, the you know the all I I always said I could do didn't have a tenor solo to uh, Ben Webster said you about all. When your sister tells, uh, Basie had a red list out there. She still tells a big band is a great jazz big band. It's always have the great solo player to the tango. Um, I said, I have the, I have a do. I was very lucky that I have a do, supremo player. But for, but the, I'm not quite sure if it was a good for do, uh, was, but that's something else. So, uh, I think I think I think the I was a writer and he didn't know what I was writing, but uh, uh, mainly mainly I was just in his tenor and his flute, and uh, that made it I think as a band uh, a little unique and it was just you know sound also because he was uh, supreme player and he got. All the saxophone section. We started in Los Angeles, so that's another thing. I think it's lucky in a sense of fact that Los Angeles musicians they all have double because usually they have their studio player, but they're good. Um, Lou got them all, and they all play. They all double. So I said, hmm, I better use that. So there are the woodwind section, then there was the five flute tunes, and. It was because out there at my exposal, and that became my sort of trademark. So you know, it's it's. Uh, I got lot because it was a band. The musician was there. The availability was there. So I think it's uh, all of those things. Uh, I owe a lot to Lou. And the and the label, I'm so fascinated. I would have I would have been running around with copies of 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 uh, these records on uh, Ascent A S C E N T. Yes, this is Ascent. A, this is a label that that you created, and 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 yes. 
it was a West Coast jazz label. What was the uh, what was the idea behind that label? Because I, I I'm looking right now at this. Well, because we couldn't we couldn't get the American record company to uh, interested in us, oh. and uh, we, we needed a record here. We thought we needed a record here, and uh, we were recording for the Japanese record company. There were there were four uh, recording was picked up by. I'll say it here, but after that, they did not pick up anything. So, you know, that was the main reason. But shortly, that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. That's what it was. Hey, Toshiko, I uh, I must tell you, it's uh, it's been a long time coming, but I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk to me today. And uh, oh, my pleasure. And and uh, continued success, and and uh, keep learning, uh, and uh, keep teaching. Actually, you know, my cur- I'm I'm curious. Uh, do you do you what is the how what kind of Japanese musicians are out there these days? In so far as uh, jazz, I mean, I know that the, I know. Uh, the, I don't know. New York doesn't really have that uh, uh, Japanese musician. There's a, some good one in Japan now. You know, young some player. They used to be in here. They used to play when the break he was alive for a short time, or so on. Some some actually played very well. Uh, but they're in Japan. But it's just here, uh, I don't know any Japanese uh, jazz musician, that is. And I only you know, but, but the New York area. But at the same time, I'm not very, uh, you know, well-informed. <laughs> I don't go out. You don't go out don't that go much. Around, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't go around, make a round or anything yeah. like that. So. <laughs> hey, t- Toshiko, uh... Yeah, there's some good one in Japan. Yeah. Hey, listen, uh, you, 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 you and Lou uh, g- get back to hanging out and, and making yeah. more good music, and uh, we'll be in touch, my friend. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Nice talking to you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.